T-minus two hours, 59 minutes and 55 seconds. We are now out of the T-minus three-hour hold. Yeah, very exciting, Albert. Uh, you can see uh, there in the view that uh, the weather's looking looking very nice. There are some clouds out there as I drove in today. Uh, you could see some some uh, slight buildups, but um, I think that the word I heard is they're expecting a sea breeze to help push that stuff out of the way, and uh, weather's still looking 80% go. And you can... Uh and by the way, thank you for saying 80% go as opposed to our traditional 20% no go. Yeah, I prefer the, uh, the glass half full. <laughs> you, and, you and me both. Uh, I, I, you can actually see a pretty good shot of the sea breeze they were talking about on those flags that they, they're kind of whipping along. Now, that's some, uh, now, obviously, it's nothing that we're concerned about right now, but uh, crosswind is one of those things that uh, Absolutely. We, look, we have to watch. That's right. Crosswinds uh, can be a factor. Um, actually, even uh, head and, headwind and tailwind can affect uh, landing energy and result in... Um, the ascent team having to make some adjustments. Actually, it's the entry team that makes the adjustments to uh, how we'll fly the approach if we had to come back on what we call an RTLS, a return to launch site. And uh, that would only happen, you know, for some kind of a system malfunction or a, perhaps a loss of a main engine. Um, we would come back around to, to Kennedy and land shortly after launch. Fortunately, that's something we've obviously never had to do. Never and, had to do. And, but but it's, it's, uh, I guess it's good to have that backup it, option. Absolutely. It's good to have the capability. And it's, it's something that we as astronauts train to quite a bit, uh, that and also the transatlantic abort. Uh, we'll practice those in the sims, and the, the crew here um, would have uh, practiced this just within the last few days in, over at Johnson Space Center. And the transatlantic sites you're talking about are, typically have three locations um, overseas that in, in both uh, Spain and France that allow us to land if needed if we lose an engine or something and not quite able to make it to orbit. It gives us another option to be able to safely land the shuttle and get the crew out. And That's right, and it can be uh, an engine problem or it can also be, you know, for example, like a cabin leak where we, uh, we need to get down to the ground. And uh, there's a certain point where we can't come back to Kennedy and we wouldn't want to go to orbit per with a large enough cabin leak where we would lose our atmosphere. So, you know, it gives us an option in that kind of a situation too. And that's one of those things we also track very carefully when it comes to weather and, and it's sometimes hard for people to understand that we'll you'll look outside you'll see the pad shot yes i see some big clouds in the background there but yeah. but at the same time it's a gorgeous sunny day and you are scrubbing because you don't have your transatlantic uh landing sites that's available right. yeah because of european weather and uh that's happened i i understand pretty rare uh rarely but um we just need one of the three transatlantic sites to be go for weather in order to launch and uh, so normally, normally they will work out because uh, we have one site that's Marone Air Base in southwest uh, Spain, one in the northeast of Spain, Zaragoza Air Base, and then uh, East France, which is uh, in the south near Marseille in France. So typically one of those will turn out with good weather and come through for us. And right now we are forecast go at, uh, in uh, Marone, as a matter of fact, the last report I got. Hmm. And we've got uh, the SCS-124 Discovery crew yeah, walking their way down. You can see Commander Mark Kelly and Pilot Ken Ham leading the way. Greg Shamatoff, our station astronaut, who's going to be switching out. And uh, also Chief of our office, Steve Lindsay. Brent Jett, who's the lead of the Flight Crew Operations Division. And uh, the other gentleman in the blue suit there is Jerry Ross, one of our veteran astronauts and the lead of the Vehicle Integration Test Team Office. There's uh, Jose Hernandez, a classmate of mine and one of the astronaut support personnel there. Watch them as they go down. This is it. They're in the elevator now. They'll come down and walk down the shot that you've seen many times before, down the ramp and head right to the Astro Van. That's right. See the crowd of uh, employees from KSC there. They'll meet them.
you get my message? Okay. We told many astronauts have actually said that uh, doing what we just saw right now when you uh, line up there and head into the Astro Van, really, that brings it home that you're really actually about ready to launch. This is a, it's for real. Yeah, I haven't been there yet, Allard, but uh, that just looks like uh, you just got to be uh, thrilled, excited, especially they're going out knowing that the weather's looking looking real good. And, uh, so, yeah, um, I imagine it's a mix of uh, a lot of emotions, and um, I know they're very excited to go up and, and get the mission underway. Well, they are escorted and driven uh, about eight miles or so. It takes approximately a half an hour or so. To, uh, to drive that with a short stopover actually here to drop off the, uh, I believe, the flight search. It's dropped off at the Launch Control Center uh, uh, very briefly, and then they head on the rest of the three-mile trek to the uh, to the launch pad. Yeah, that's right, and I think they'll actually stop a little short of that and uh, let Steve Lindsay, our astronaut office chief, uh, exit the Astro Van, and he'll head out to the shuttle landing facility where he's going to climb into a T-38 and provide weather surveillance back to Mission Control and, and here to KSC weather on what he's seeing here in the local area. And, uh, and I think uh, Jerry Ross, the, the VIT lead, will also uh, jump out at, at the Launch Control Center. The banner was And as the crew uh, heads out to the launch pad, the final inspection team is actually heading back from the launch pad. Uh, nothing of consequent to, re to report right now. They didn't have to uh, take any. We do have the ability out at the launch pad to do directly link pictures that they've taken uh, in, to the Launch Control Center, so engineers and technicians can take a, a closer look if there's any issues, but they didn't have to do that, so that's a good sign. That's a very good sign. Yeah, everything's progressing really well. Well, Howard, when the, the Astrovan gets out there to the pad, probably what we're going to see is the, uh, the crew is going to exit the Astrovan along with uh, one of the insertion techs, Ray Cuevas, uh, we'll see him. He's wearing the uh, white suit with the number seven on the back. And uh, he will be strapping in the astronauts who will be on the mid-deck today. Um, typically, the crew will climb out and uh, put their helmet bags uh, over by the elevator and then take a stroll out and, uh, and look at the orbiter from ground level, take it all in before they head on up the elevator uh, to the 195-foot level where they begin their ingress. And the crew's uh, beginning to exit the Astro Van, taking their, uh, you can see their helmet bags that they're carrying over towards the elevator. From a little ways away, they're going to take a look up at their uh, soon to be their ride into space, Discovery. And they're home for the next two weeks. That's right. <laughs>